Hi, this is The Philosophical Angle, and I am your host, Chris Angle. I am the author of four books on philosophy, one of which is Defining Ethics, Good and Evil. These books are available free for viewing online at www.philosophypublishing.com. Along with me is my panelist, Rick Samuelson. Rick graduated from Yale, has an MBA from Wharton, an MA from Tufts. He's a former investment banker and is presently a venture capitalist. Welcome, Rick. Thank you. The purpose of the philosophical angle is to examine and explicate the nature of the concepts and topics being used in current media and compare its essence with the usage and circumstances and how they're being used. Well, occasionally we have a special edition of the Philosophical Angle, and this is one of them. Today will be an analysis of the 2013 inauguration speech by Barack Obama. So, let's get to it. First, I'm going to read sections directly from the inauguration, the inaugural speech itself. As reported by the New York Times. I'll just not read the whole speech, but just segments from it, and fr we'll take those segments and we'll put them on the board and we'll analyze them. He starts by saying, referring to the enduring strength of our Constitution and what makes us exceptional, which is articulated in a declaration more than made uh, than two centuries ago. And then he quotes the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Later on, together we determined that a modern economy requires roads and highways to speed travel and commerce, school and colleges to train our workers. Together we discovered that a free market only thrives when there are rules to ensure competition and fair play. Together we resolved that a great nation must care for the vulnerable and protect its people from life's worst ha hazards and misfortune. Through it all, we have never relinquished our skepticism of central authority, nor have we succumbed to the fiction that all society's ills can be cured through government alone. A little bit later. We have always understood that when times change, so must we. That fidelity to our founding principles requires new responses to new challenges. That preserving our individual freedoms ultimately requires collective action. And he goes on to say that America's possibilities are limitless. For we, the people, understand that our country cannot succeed when a shrinking few do very well and a growing many barely make it. Wow. We must harness new ideas and technology to remake our government, revamp our tax code, reform our schools, and empower our citizens with the skills they need to work together. I'm sorry, he actually said to work harder. We must make the hard choices to reduce the cost of health care and the size of our deficit. But we reject the belief that America must choose between caring for the generation that built this country and investing in the generation that will build its future. 
a little later on in the same paragraph, the commitments we make to each other through Medicare and Medicaid and Social Security. These things do not sap our initiative. They strengthen us. We, the people, still believe that our obligations as Americans are not just to ourselves, but to all posterity. We will respond to the threat of climate change. Then we're going to skip a few paragraphs where he says, we will support democracy from Asia to Africa. A few paragraphs later, for our journey is not complete until our wives, our mothers, and daughters can earn a living equal to their efforts. Next paragraph. That is our generation's task, to make these words, these rights, these values of life and liberty and pursuit of happiness real for every American. Okay. Let's analyze these words. First, he talks about the Constitution and then immediately goes to the Declaration of Independence where he says, all men are created equal. And these are unalienable rights. And from there, he goes to the economy and the need for an infrastructure and for learning by developing schools and colleges, obviously very laudable. He, he references the free market and the need for competition and for fairness within competition. I Probably he's referring to the rule of law and really the rule of law and regulations to promote fairness and competition. Laudable. Now, after the opening section, his, uh, his ideas change to a different topic. The nation cares for the vulnerable. We must protect its people. And when he says we, he seems to be referring to the government must protect its people from life's hazards, which leads me to think that he's trying to eliminate risk from one's life. <clears throat> but he says these are new times with new responses. And he was referring that right after to his mention of the Constitution. I'm not so sure, I'm, I'm a little bit worried about that statement. I hope he doesn't think that he, I hope he doesn't ignore the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Individual freedom, he's, work, he's talking about collective action and we cannot act alone. Again, referring to no risk. Then he jumps to a third topic. Few do well. Many do poorly. And these poor are growing. And therefore, we need welfare. That is, to protect, the government must protect its people. And we can see this in his actions. Uh, food stamps have gone up tremendously in, during his la the last four years. And we definitely have larger government. We definitely have larger welfare. So this statement is certainly consistent with his actions. Then he goes to a fourth idea. We must care for the older generation. We must invest in the new generation. 
We must uphold commitments to the Medicaid and Medicare and Social Security. And interesting enough, he adds in climate change, kind of right out of the blue. And from this, people should earn a living equal to their effort. Uh, a remarkable statement uh, because when you earn a living, it's not just your effort. You also must do that within a risk and with the knowledge that you have in order to get any reward. Any reward requires risk of doing something, your knowledge, your time, your effort, whatever material you've got uh, that you want to use to produce your reward. It's as if this effort is to be without risk or without knowledge. It's almost as if it's almost as if it were communism. All will get the same amount, no matter what risk you put into it, no matter what knowledge you apply to your subject. And then, so I'm going to summarize again this and trying to condense it and make some conclusions. Collective action seems to be at the center of this speech in the form of, in the form of government. More government programs for the infrastructure, for the schools, for the f to, to establish fair play, to care for the vulnerable, to care for the older generation, to protect its people, and thus producing a, a rising welfare and the various types of government services that are being offered to the people, the, the Medicare, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the Social Security, the Obamacare, whatever. And from this collective action, he states, we cannot act alone. American individual, which, and if you cannot act alone, you, for, you can forget American individualism. It's out because you've got a partner of government. So more government programs. We're going to remake government, which means more government. And that effort for equal pay, elimination of risk, the shepherd shall take care of the government's sheep. In other words, Europe Europeanization is before us and is the end of the road to which he wants to, to take us according to this speech, as I see it. Again, back here, when the disappearance of American individualism will produce the success of the wealthy, and, and this is to be eliminated. It appears that he doesn't like the success of the wealthy because they are fewer in number than those who don't do as well. And that can be backed up by his actions. He has constantly said and promoted that the, we that the wealthy should pay their fair share, whatever that is. But it seems to be more and more payment to the government. And the loss of American individual means the loss of incentive. And is what the American individualism is what has brought us to our point that we've, that we've gone in the last 200 years to the successes that we've all enjoyed. Well, I've spoken enough here. Let's go to our, our panelist, Rick Samuelson, and see what Rick has to say about all of this and the inaugural and, and the speech of Obama on the 21st of January. Rick? Well, uh, re reading through the conservative commentary, uh, the reaction has been predictably harsh. 
Um, as you as you say, um, the, the aspirations, central aspirations of the speech read like a kind of laundry list of progressive um, uh, aims that have been uh, kicking around for for a number of years now. Uh, another thing that's been mentioned, of course, is there's no uh, uh, discussion of bipartisanship anywhere in the speech. Uh, it's almost as if he is challenging the Republican Party uh, to uh, attack uh, his agenda and um, is ready for a fight, uh, which is interesting. What I, what, I, what I find most notable about the speech is what it doesn't mention um, by way of the central concerns that uh, the voters have, have uh, alluded to in many surveys, namely high unemployment, for example, uh, runaway government spending, for example, um, overregulation, certainly that's been a consistent theme uh, mentioned by the business community. Uh, there was no uh, discussion of how private enterprise uh, can achieve any of these goals, uh, which is striking um, to anyone who's involved in the private sector. And so, uh, as you say, it, it's, it's, it's striking uh, the degree to which the discussion focuses on what are obviously government-led solutions um, and almost to the exclusion, if not um, uh, trivialization, of what have been the traditional engines of uh, wealth generation in this country, you know, namely private enterprise. Yeah, that last topic, wealth generation. So really, in order for us to become successful, we obviously need to generate wealth. He seems to think that it has to be in partnership with the government and that private enterprise cannot do it by itself. What do you think? Can private enterprise do it by itself or almost by, by itself or to some degree? It seems that he thinks that it has to be, everything has to be in cooperation with the government. Is well, you know, look, uh, the government, uh, we, we live by a rule of law. Uh, the government uh, necessarily uh, sustains that rule of law and executes it. Uh, and that's always been true. Uh, where I think it, it's, it's a question of emphasis. He, he does not seem to, to understand that the source of the wealth generation is solely the private sector and always has been. Uh, there is obviously a role for the government in terms of um, assisting that effort. Uh, there's obviously a role for the government in terms of um, sustaining a, a reliable judiciary and enforcing uh, necessary rules. Uh, but the government can never be the source of that wealth generation. Uh, and that's where I think he goes wrong. So do you think that the overall direction of the speech is to prepare America for a general, the general direction of heading to what Europe is today, a Europeanization of the United States, if you will? Is that that's what I came to conclude that the, to the, the ultimate point of this speech. What, what do you think? I wouldn't disagree with that assessment, but I, I think that the speech is framed 
through the lens of the civil rights movement, uh, namely that the first priority is to uh, assist uh, gays, women, uh, the disadvantaged, to achieve their fair share, if you will, and their quote unquote equal rights. And then out of that will flow um, a, what is necessarily a more socialist style of, of, of economy and government. Right, so there seems to be a few themes running through the, the speech. Larger government, uh, the constant uh, referral to, uh, to the Declaration of Independence and equal rights for all, and the individual cannot do it by himself. That last statement, the individual cannot do it by himself, that collective action is needed. Is that true? Do you think collective action is needed for the individual entrepreneur? Well, again, this is all consistent with an emphasis on rights at the expense of responsibilities. You know, in some sense, a, a, an entrepreneur who starts a business uh, is exercising the ultimate in responsibility, uh, particularly if he's put his life savings at risk in order to start the business. Uh, that's kind of at one extreme. At the other extreme, there are people who live for years on end on some form of welfare uh, and don't take nearly the responsibility for ensuring that they support themselves uh, that they arguably could. Uh, and it's clear that uh, President Obama, his sympathies lie with that latter group, not with the former group. Okay. Let's go back to our little chart here. Collective action, more government, and these policies or programs that he refers to in this speech, they're all laudable. They're all something everybody would go, wow, gee, they are, we'd certainly want to do that. So really, in order to initiate or have these programs in place, is the government needed or can private enterprise, does private enterprise have the ability to accomplish these goals? And secondarily, are these goals what we should be looking at for U.S. policy. What do you think, Rick? Well, you're, you're never going to achieve all of those goals without a growing pie. And so if you don't find a way to generate more wealth, uh, and certainly at a more rapid pace than we have over the course of Mr. Obama's presidency, uh, you, you will never, through simple government fiat, be able to uh, enjoy a larger percentage of the population uh, having a better lifestyle with more opportunities. Uh, because, frankly, what with immigration being where it is and normal population growth, we continue to um, outgrow uh, our population, effective population, continues to outgrow the pace at which we're growing the economy. Uh, so that's a non-starter. Uh, but what's remarkable in the, in the speech is that there's so little emphasis on uh, getting the economy growing again in order to achieve those ends. Right. It was all about government and uh, and, and particularly this section where he speaks of the schools and the fair play and, and uh, we got to care for this and we got to do that and we got to help everybody and there should be equal pay for everybody. It kind of reminds me of, you know, I just, you know, just 
Thomas More and Utopia. Um, it, it's, it's like, as you say, you have this goal. It's not achievable in a perfect world. It is not a perfect world. We have risk everywhere, and in every decision, there is risk. And it seems as though he wants to take risk away from all, pretty much kind of like the Europeans attempt to do it also. And look at their stagnant society. Uh, they can't even defend themselves. Uh, look what a, what a time that France has just trying to uh, ship a, a few things to uh, overseas against some um, terrorists. And they want America to f foot the bill. No, no problem. Uh, but that society is, has failed and is, is failing even uh, as, as, as time goes by. Well, I would like to thank Rick. Uh, Rick, if you have any last uh, uh, summary words, uh, we have about 30 seconds. Okay, the, the, only, the final thing I would say is that there is one mention in the speech about controlling the deficit. There is no mention about the national debt. And what that suggests to me is that he sees no reason whatsoever to control in a significant way the growth of the national debt and at some level believes that no matter how much it rises, the United States will always be able to borrow uh, on favorable terms. Yes, good point. And it was rather curious that, uh, uh, that he mentioned uh, uh, that about de deficit reduction. I want to thank Rick for joining us, and I want to thank my audience for joining he us here on the Philosophical Angle. And we'll see you next week. Thank you very much. Thank you.